The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So, for the first question somebody was just asking me, I will repeat that because it's uh, one of those questions which is quite helpful, is that when people do sharing of merits, uh, does it work? And that I know it's something which uh, you see is traditional in Buddhism and they've got some uh, support for that in the Buddha's teachings but how does it work in today's world? And first of all, that there is um, a phenomena which uh, many people can experience and that is when somebody close to you has an accident or they may you know, unfortunately die. And the story which I want to uh, uh, include was something which I read many years ago when I was visiting Melbourne. It was a story in the Melbourne Age. And it was about a, um, a veterinary surgeon who was uh, finished work on a Friday and was uh, traveling to somewhere in country Victoria for a weekend with his friends. And uh, halfway along the journey, maybe a two hour journey, he was alone in his car. He was overcome by inexplicably strong emotions. They were so strong, he started crying. He didn't know why, but it was such strong grief for no reason that he had to pull up into the emergency lane, park his car, and just you know, wait there until the, the emotions passed away. And of course, he never knew why until he arrived at the house where he was going to spend the weekend, where there was a message waiting for him that his dog had been hit by a car uh, you know, in his residence here in Melbourne somewhere at the same time, exactly the same time, that he was overcome with grief. And uh, because he was a respected uh, veterinary surgeon, that uh, the article was reported in the Melbourne Age, and he said just how weird it is that somebody you love, someone you're very close to, something happens to them and you know straight away. You feel that something's very wrong. And there is that connection which we have between beings. Not just human beings, but you know, animals we're very, very close to. We know that something's wrong. How does that work? There is a connection there, mind to mind. You might call it telepathy, but you know, very rarely do people manage to develop the ability to, to, use, to use that at will, but sometimes we experience that. And it's the same when I was saying at the end of a meditation retreat that I very often ask people to think of someone who's alive, a close friend who's not at the retreat, to really visualize them and then to wish them happiness and well-being. You know, but no, much more intensely than that. And then I asked them just as an experiment <laughs> to prove that it works. Give them a call when you go home and just ask them, not a leading question, but ask at that particular time in the afternoon, what were you doing? And it was amazing, just I stopped doing that now because people would ring me up at night, Ajahn Bam, you wouldn't believe it worked. I said, of course it worked, I know it works. And then I put the phone down, somebody else would ring. Ah, it worked. But it does work. You can try it for yourself. If you have a very strong mind, you now at the end of a meditation retreat, then you can actually focus on a person. They feel it. There is a connection. I'm establishing that there is a connection there. And once you have that connection, it's amazing what you can send across that connection. So if it's somebody even living, you can wish them well. And of course, that's one of the reasons what. Okay, no, one of the reasons why that they ask like monks, meditating monks, can you please pray for my uncle who's sick in hospital? They don't pray. You just we think of them, visualize them, especially if you know them really so strongly, and then send energy to them, energy, whatever that is. But just, may they feel better, may they feel well. And this is what we do to the living, and even those who just especially recently passed away, wishing them well. And it, it does work. So that's actually how it works. The spreading of merits, sharing of merits. So that's actually how we do these things. 
Okay, uh, so just getting the questions rolling. Now, any other, who's also going to ask a question? Because it's supposed to be question time for half an hour. Trouble is, a lot of time when it's question time, it's usually answer time, not question time, because I spend my time giving long-winded answers. <laughs> yes. Hello, Ajahn Brahm. Haven't Hello. seen you for a while. I'd like to know how you are, please. How you are? Oh, that's a very deep question. <laughs> I, I, now, I ask deep questions. Uh, I learned it from you. If you're talking about my body, my body is in pretty good shape. <laughs> but it's only just the throat is a little bit sort of... Um, uh, a bit sort of... Uh, it's called... You weren't here this morning. I explained it in depth. It's called the pony virus. Pony virus. It makes you a little horse. <laughs> okay. She's groaning now. You should know better to ask me a question like that. Now, that's actually how the body is. But, you know, you aren't the body. So we say how, how you are. How's your mind? And even if the body is sick, the mind doesn't need to be sick. That's the saying of the Buddha. So the body just does its body thing. And the mind is something different. So my mind is very healthy. Okay, that's my, my, my mind. So when you say, how am I? How are you? Again, okay, that's a very deep question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I yeah, should know better than to ask because you. Because <laughs> at least I'm not a hypocrite. Because every time I come to a place like this, I ask a question. How many of you here have never been sick? Is anyone here who's never been sick in their life? So it means you've all been sick. Is that a good assumption? So there's nothing wrong with being sick. It's quite normal to be sick. So you ask me, how am I? Normal. <laughs> I've been sick. What's wrong with that? Ajahn Brahm, thank you for coming to Melbourne. My question is, does Buddhism believe in life outside our planet? Yes. <coughs> Aliens exist. <laughs> but one of the reasons you've never seen them is because aliens are too smart. They're, it's called intelligent life. They're too intelligent to come to a place like this. I mean, who would come to <laughs> the planet Earth? <coughs> no, there's no reason why there is not such thing as aliens. So is there any, was it something in Buddhist teachings about having reborn as a being outside this planet? I know many of my friends, I'm sure they weren't born on this planet, not by some of the things they do and say. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sure they're aliens. But no, it is that, um, it really depends. Usually people are, re are reborn, sort of in a place they feel comfortable. Because, you know, sometimes even if you go on a holiday, if you go to another destination, where would you go? It's only if you feel you're, you're comfortable in such a destination. So it's very difficult when people you know, have a little understanding about what an alien life form would look like or would actually feel. Obviously, one of the reasons why they don't get reborn there. You've got to have some feeling for it to be able to be reborn in such a place. So it's very difficult. Yes. Oh, you're just waving. Oh, yeah. Go on. Hi. <laughs> oh, That's by the okay. way, I should also ask, are there any aliens here today? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. But look, I'm just going on on this, because this is an interesting one. There was one of the Anagarikas. These are people who are postulates to become a monk. And one of the reasons uh, he felt free to become a monk was the experience he had with his girlfriend, a long-term relationship with a girl. And this girl always claimed that when she was young, that she was abducted. And now, uh, of course, straight away some people say, oh, you know, the mad schizophrenia, or just go and see a, a, a doctor. But this particular girl could actually speak a, a strange language. And she was so bad at in all other aspects of her life, and she could speak this strange language, 
that I think one of, I think what was the ABC? George Negus, apparently. He actually did a documentary. Because this girl, who could speak this weird language, <coughs> there was another girl in Portugal. The only other person in the world they could find who could speak the same language. They could understand each other. So it wasn't as though a crazy made up language, it was a language which only two people in this world could actually understand. And the other girl in Portugal also claimed that she learned this after she was abducted. And that was, you know, talking to the Anna Garica, she said, this is my girlfriend, she was, you know, sane as could be, and it was on an ABC program, because I don't watch the TV, I don't know exactly what the program was, but it was of um, two people in the world who could speak the same language. And then she went to the shops one day and disappeared, never came back. No trace of her. She vanished. And that was where he decided, well, she's gone. So he became, he came to become an Anagarika apostle to Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. So when you have like personal stories, people you know, I didn't know the girl, but I certainly knew the Anagarika an honest fella, weird stuff. So the very least to keep an open mind. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I have a question with regards to the question, how are you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you look at um, Buddhist scriptures, you have this notion of don't do idle speech. Yeah. Right, so what, what, what I mean, for yeah. you as a monk, that may be easy, but what do I do if I'm in the office? <laughs> in the office. Like, um, you, you know, you, you, if a colleague approaches me and I start speaking Dharma to them, they are like, uh, and go away. <laughs> but Well, like, those of you here before lunch uh, could have uh, seen that I was talking uh, jokes to the children. Uh, the coffin story joke and ghost story jokes. You say, what's that got to do with the Dhamma? Am I wasting time? But the answer was no, because many of the younger generation, they come to a temple, they get bored stiff when they hear the same old stuff and they have to learn by rote. So it's on purpose. I make sure that, especially when the children are here, there's an entertainment there. They feel safe, they feel fun. They come into a Buddhist temple, it's not boring, and they're given attention. And then that is leading in to later on in their life, they trust the monks and the nuns, so that later on in their life they can actually come when they can really need the help of monks and nuns with deeper questions on life. So the idle chatter, it is, you know, sometimes it's like gossiping, backbiting, uh, you know, saying bad things about people. You should never do things like that. But when it's other stuff in the office, talking to people about the economy or whatever, sometimes what that is, is actually getting connections, <coughs> being friendly, and later on, you know, because you're a person they can relate to, who's kind, who's interested in them, later on, maybe they can say, well, why are you, you know, what do you do on a, a Sunday afternoon going to these temples? So it's just a way of learning how to be kind to people learning how to be gentle, to listen to them. And later on, that opens the opportunity. It's like kind, it's personable speech. And that means we do create these, these bonds of friendship and trust. This is important. It's got a purpose. Oh, over there, yeah? Oh, there's quite a few. Oh, there's one, two, three. So there, and then it comes uh, between the two of you and then to you. Yeah. Ajahn, uh, uh, the, when we die and uh, you know, go into the next life, most of the time that our habits will go, but the memories uh, uh, seems to be almost disappearing. So how I understand is memory seems to be storing in the brain and you know, when it goes into the new body, that may disappear. Is that... Yeah, this is the difference between the brain and the mind we're talking, talking about, because it is the case that when you do hypnosis, you don't access your memories through the brain, you access them through the mind. 
a different channel. And that really means that you can recall past lives, you know, through um, a hypnotic regression or through meditation. And, you know, you find out that uh, as the baby is, uh, develops, that it usually loses its ability uh, to rely upon its mind and the brain sort of takes over. But a very beautiful phenomenon which I was talking about as we came in here uh, was something which I have seen and I've read about and uh, it's got much more traction these days so it's got a name, terminal lucidity which is when a person, they may be under morphine they may have been in a coma they may have had dementia and at the last few moments of their life they wake up and they become clear and even to the case that their brain is not functional anymore they can still speak and see and their memories are intact and this is where that uh, you see that uh, uh, what are some of the cases there? The most extreme case was if anyone can find this I'd really be very grateful because I remember reading it, it was of all magazines, it was in a Time magazine a special, quite a few years ago now a special edition related to the mind where there was a, an anecdote of a, a, a surgeon, a, a doctor over in the United States whose um, uh, patient was, uh, had a brain tumour and as the, <coughs> as the tumour developed it was developing at such a predictable rate that the doctor could actually predict you know, pretty accurately just when they would lose the certain bodily functions and even to the point where we know it's probably you know, within a day or two, this is the day when uh, eventually the brain will not be able to keep the, uh, the heart and the lungs going so you know that she, uh, he will die and so all the family were around at the time and the tumour had just basically colonised the whole brain by this time so they were around there by the patient's bedside and the last uh, incredibly long time, 20 minutes or so if I remember correctly the last 20 minutes he opened his eyes and talked and asked about everybody, how are you doing darling and, and what happened to, to you know, your, your degree, did you pass? and he was lucid, clearly lucid for the last 20, 25 minutes when the brain was not there, it was dysfunctional and he hadn't been lucid for days, for months even and so this is a phenomenon called terminal lucidity you can just go on Google and terminal lucidity and actually just to see that it's the only explanation is the brain is now totally dysfunctional and so the mind takes over so that is where long-term memories are stored which is you know, why they can remember past lives so there's a question between here uh, your question first because in line yes. <laughs> I turn with my gratitude. Um, the other gentleman has touched briefly on what I want to ask, but I want to ask Ajahn, how can I, um, uh, how can I make a non-religious person to be religious? <laughs> that means I want them to be guided, my children, yeah. specifically to be guided by Buddha, Buddhist lights, yeah. and then to head down the right track of yeah. life. But Please. first of all, when you speak to your children, they would always listen to you. Believe it or not, they don't make out they're listen to, listening to you, but still they hear everything you say, and they love you, and they want to do the right thing for you. They've also got the peer pressure as well, you know, from their friends at school and others. And so one thing you know, to make Buddhism cool, you know, makes it very helpful <laughs> for the kids to follow it. And number two, to give them some teachings which mean something for them. And they go to school, you know, they're Buddhists. Wow, you're Buddhist, that's really cool. <laughs> and uh, they don't even call it religious, call it spiritual. And then lastly, just when you actually um, help and teach your kids you know, to meditate, but teach in such a way 
that you know they can do it and they know how it's done and they feel so good afterwards, then of course they you know they're meditators and they love it, and it's so useful for their education. Even though I have to try to sow the seeds right now, or they haven't got any un any conditioned causes from the past. Yeah, exactly. Because they can still, um, they can value something like Buddhism. It's not forced on people, which is a beautiful part of it, but it also has some very wonderful effects. It's also very cheap. It's high value, but no cost. Okay, you had a question in the front here. Your question now. Yes, please. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, Ajahn, um, um, I've just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether, um, when I look at my life around me, I kind of get the reason, I mean, I'm very much in kind of um, comfort, I suppose, with what I yeah. have around me. And I feel as though I I know why I have the things I have, or I, yeah. I don't know what I. I'm not saying I have a lot, yeah. but I'm just, and I'm just thinking uh, explanations as to all the good and bad things that I have around me, yeah. and I'm thinking that uh, I can. I I wonder whether I've had the same habits always yeah. in sansara, and. Uh, there are things I want to change about me, but I want, I, I would, I'm wondering whether even if I was to change it right now, would it, would I be able to carry it further? Yeah, is that exactly. linked to the brain or the mind? Yeah, yeah, you do have similar habits, but they do change from life to life. Even like sometimes the habits you had as a young, uh, young girl going to school, sometimes your friends will look at you and say, oh, you've changed. You're calmer, you're more peaceful, or hopefully not. Oh, you're much more angry and more demanding these days than you were when you were young. Hope it is a positive change. A positive, that positive change can happen. But and after a while, it sticks. Once you want to fix, yeah, you would I, like to work on as yeah, well. Yeah, but the thing is, the way to work on it, the main ones are like the, the greed, hatred, and delusion, the three, they call them the three poisons. The, there's the wanting. And how much do you want? Just how many more possessions do you want? Oh, just in case. And then, but in the end, you know, you can't, as they say, can't take anything with you. Or oh, there was that, that lawyer in Melbourne who found a way to try and take, take his wealth with him. He looked, because he was getting very sick, he knew he was going to die. He was a clever fellow, had lots of money. So, uh, on his deathbed video for days and days and days, he thought about it and got the solution. He told his wife, he said, go to the bank, and then there's two really big suitcases which I use when I go on holidays and vacations. Take them to the bank and get them filled with 1,000 euro notes. That's probably that's the biggest um, denomination. I don't know, is that right? 1,000 euros? Notes? 100, well, anyway, with high currency notes. Pack them in the suitcases. It's my money, so the bank should allow this. And take them up into the attic above my bedroom and place them just in the right place, maybe about uh, 1,200 millimeters apart, directly over my bed, so that when I die, when my body goes up to heaven, I can grab hold of them <laughs> as I go up to heaven. And so she did that, and a few days later he died, and after the funeral and everything was, was finished, she went up into the attic and the bags were still there. <laughs> it's a stupid husband. He should have put them in the same position, but in the room below his bed, because I knew which way he was going. <laughs> I think you got the message of the joke. <laughs> but of course you can't take that sort of stuff with you, but you can, obviously, just your character, the way you change. And the best way, greed, hatred, delusion, the ill will. Sometimes changing yourself is ill will towards part of yourself. 
It's more of the same. I want to get rid of my bad habits. I'm not really good enough. I don't know why I'm like this. You don't have any motivation to grow. So the human mind and body grows by itself, not because of wanting, but because of kindness. And accepting? And acceptance, yes. Wisdom. Wisdom power. And they say, ah, oh, this is okay. You know, it's just have a few little quirks of character. You know, we're all sort of different, that's fine. They're all <coughs> they crooked bricks in the wall. If all the walls were perfect, what a boring world that would be. So you've got a few little quirks of character, fine. But then you're not angry at them. You don't sort of want to sort of make them different. And you're content and easily satisfied. Which is brilliant. Then you're finally free. Thank you. Yep, over there. Uh, Ajahn, uh, you may have answered this question in another forum or elsewhere. My apologies if you have. But my question is, um, do you have a message to the people of Sri Lanka about how to move forward following uh, the recent violence? He certainly. And that is just put the violence in perspective. I was uh, born in 51 in London. In those days, there was still, I still remember what was called bomb sites. Destroyed buildings, whole areas, which had yet been redeveloped after the Second World War. And I remember talking to my parents, especially my mother and grandmother, because they were in London during that time. And there were bombs going off everywhere, every night, for months and months. And it's not saying that bombs and people dying and being blown to smithereens is good. But we've got to a point now that, <coughs> that death is unnatural. That somehow or other when people die, it's the worst thing in the world. And that uh, we're afraid and we want to blame anybody or somebody that when people die, and of course terrorists make use of that. So, people are dead. So, let's not over-exaggerate death. And instead, go back to Sri Lanka. Go to those hotels, help rebuild them. Don't follow the way of fear. Because if a terrorist keeps people away from going to Sri Lanka, keeps people away from celebrating Waisak, or going to the church for some ceremony, then the terrorists have win. What does the terrorist mean? It means creating terror in people. So we refuse to bow to terror. And if we get killed, it's worth it to actually to create some peace and harmony in this world. So please put things in perspective. A number of people died, and it's a shame it's for those people whose relations they are, it's a lot of grief. But nevertheless, it shouldn't stop us going straight back to Sri Lanka. If I wasn't coming here and had a bit of a cold, you know, if there was a way, the Waysack day over in Sri Lanka, if I was free, I would have jumped on the plane and just gone to a Waysack celebration in Sri Lanka, the biggest possible, just to show that, you know, we should never follow fear. And as for the violence, we never, we never protect Buddhism just by violence. People you now just saying that sometimes, oh, we've got to preserve Buddhism in Sri Lanka. What type of Buddhism are you preserving in Sri Lanka if you have to destroy other people's properties to preserve Buddhism or to kill others of nations or to, you know, to stop other people celebrating their way of spirituality? That's no way to protect Buddhism. Never was, never will be. So I think some of the very radical monks in Sri Lanka. They're the ones, I think, maybe the only people who could actually do this is the government. So anyone who promotes violence is not the way of the Buddha. And if you, your promotion of violence causes one person to die, that is Parajika, you're not a monk anymore. 
say it very strongly. So that's one of the reasons why monks should be pacifists. It's who we are. Even, I mentioned, I was happened to be in Singapore just after 9-11. And when I was there, they asked me just a question, what would you have done if you were President of the United States then? When the two planes went into the Twin Towers. And I said, and I was being quite honest, that if I was the President of the United States, at that time I would have gone on the, the, uh, the TV, and the first words I would have said, enough violence, whoever did that, whatever they did that, on behalf of the people of the United States, I forgive them. I forgive them. Enough people have died already. Let's not start another war. That was just radical. And I imagine what would happen afterwards. You know, the people in, in the Middle East would be going around not with pictures of Osama bin Laden, but the pictures of you know, President Bush. President Bush, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> because sometimes you do need to think outside the box and do something a bit different, not tit for tat, revenge, that never gets you anywhere. There were two Sri Lankan monks years ago uh, who went to the Mahabodhi temple in, um, in India, the place where the, Bo the Buddha was, uh, got enlightened. This was a time when India was uh, under the control of the British Raj and they were trying to get some freedom to use that temple for Buddhism but it was actually owned by a person called the Mahant who was a Hindu. And one of the events which really tipped public opinion into making Bodh Gaya a place where Buddhists could freely worship was that one evening they were in there meditating in the Mahabodhi shrine and a gang of thugs came in and beat them up. They were both hospitalized. And when the newspaper, the Times of India, sort of reported that, they said, well, you know, what did they look like? You saw them. And they said, yes, we saw them. Well, what did they look like? We're not saying. We refused to press charges, even though they were so badly injured. And because they forgave their assailants, there was a huge amount of public opinion went in their favor in India, and the government acted to try, they hadn't really finished yet, but to try to make that a place where Buddhists can freely enter. They could have prosecuted the assailants, but that wasn't the Buddhist way. And they got much more, much, much more positive result through forgiveness. Otherwise, Buddhists are just, they just become terrorists themselves. And that's not an, I don't want to be part of that. And you're children would say, you know, oh, Buddhism is just the same as everybody else. You know, you just, you just beat up people and destroy other people's properties when they beat up your, your friends and destroy your properties. That's not the way. Buddhism is much bigger than, better than that. Real Buddhism. So that's what I would say. And of course, you know, sometimes people don't like hearing that. But I always was inspired by even like a Gandhi who said, I can see a thousand reasons to sacrifice my life for a good cause. I can't see one reason to take the life of another. So we're willing to sacrifice our life by going in there and forgiving everybody. It doesn't matter how many lives it takes. Forgive, 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 forgive. Anyway, that's how I feel anyway. And by the way, that during that the Blitz time, that was when my mother was in a terraced house. A much closer oh when you see this sometimes you see a similar terraced house in Sydney, maybe in in a Melbourne. You know, when the houses are just so close together. Maybe in this area over here, maybe up maybe three or four houses together. And uh, with brick walls between them. 
And uh, during that, the Blitz time, the Second World War, uh, the house next door just got a direct hit from a bomb. And the uh, family there were killed instantly. And in the next uh, house, there was my mother and my grandma. And so they were bombed out. The whole house was totally destroyed. My mother, she doesn't remember, I've asked her many times, but apparently her whole her arm was lacerated with the flying glass. And my grandma was, was, was really, really distraught. But that was part of life. And they never made too much of it. They got on with their life without any fear. I remember this other gentleman, he was a New Zealander. He eventually just go, went over to Australia. And he said that when he was conscripted in the Second World War, he was one of the first people who was, uh, you know, he was um, captured and put in a, uh, in a POW camp. He managed to escape and uh, got to England. And the first day he was back in UK, freedom. He got out of Marble Arch, I remember the station, Marble Arch Station, he said, and he was going out and there was this air raid siren, which means you know, the, the, uh, the uh, planes were coming over and about to bomb London. And he immediately just turned around and ran inside the station for cover. And he found that he was a soldier, he was a hero, because you know, he would escape from the, the POW camps, but he was the only one who was running in for cover. All the other English and other people at the time, they were just <coughs> going about their business. He mentioned one person at the bus stop reading the newspaper when the sirens were going on and the bombs were about to fall. And he said just the stoicism, the phlegmatic um, character at that time was really inspiring. So, well, if it's our time to go, it's our time to go. And they carried on with their life without overreacting. He said that was an inspiration to see that the bombs would not stop their quality of life. They would go on and carry on. Or one of those entertainers, Noel Coward, that he was in some club playing and they just the sirens came, the bombs were going off, and they just carried on with their concert. They never stopped. Is that stupidity? Or is that a defiant, uh, a defiant response to people who want to terrorize you? You can kill us, maim us, but we won't stop us, stop the quality of our life. That's, that's something which is quite powerful. You see that, it's beautiful to see. That's one way we can respond to violence. Not with more violence. With something much better than that. Do you agree with that? Anyway. Okay. Okay, it was another question. Uh, yeah, there was a question around here somewhere. Yeah, okay. Okay, over here, yeah. Hello. <clears throat> um, just regarding uh, rebirth and death that you mentioned. Mm. Oh. Since there's like count perpetual rebirth and death, what's our purpose? in this particular life, in this circumstance, which everyone comes to Earth, and, or all other planets, <laughs> yeah. in their circumstance, like, what's, your what's the purpose? Life, yeah. It's one of the best things to do, is obviously to you learn. You know, the great idea of like a school, you learn just the meaning of life. And the meaning of life is not something which you're entitled to. But someone is gonna give you the instructions. The instructions of life is things we find out and discover by so many different experiences in life. So when people ask me, what's the meaning of life? It's if I can give it to you like the, the, um, the manual of you know, how to, to work your, your new iPhone, the instruction manual. No, life doesn't come with an instruction manual. You have to discover that. 
you have to find your meaning of your life. And the discovery of meaning in life, real meaning, you make many wrong turns in life. And you find that what you thought had meaning doesn't have much meaning. But then after a while, you find things which feel this really is meaningful. It's deep, it's peaceful. It has a smell of, you know, of, of deep uh, purity, goodness. And that will attract you. And little by little you go along those paths and you find it does have incredible meaning. So in the context of evolution, perpetual evolution, what's the, what's the point of it keep on going? Okay, remember yeah. evolution is only the evolution of a body. And even the evolution of a body, it devolves as well. It can't only go one way. But you know the planet Earth has got to use by date. I'm not talking about climate change. I'm talking about just the nature of, you know, of, um, of, the, you know, of uh, the sun, solar physics. This uh, sun will eventually expand. Expand so big that the Earth, the whole of Earth, will be vaporized. We will be turned into dust. And all our monuments just, you know, will all disappear. Everything will go. Of course, it's a long, long time before that happens. But just all the traces of humanity will disappear. And obviously, they can get reborn in another realm somewhere. But the idea of evolution is just so, so temporary. Evolution and evolution goes up and down. But the point is, it's not just the body, it's the mind inside the body. And sometimes even thinking, evolution, have we really evolved? Or has life got worse? We like to think that life is better all the time. But, I remember just a couple of my um, hosts, whenever I go to, to Thailand, they used to say that they used to live in a, in a house, in a place called Sarton. And they bought a, a compound in Sukhumvit. And it took them four hours in an ox cart to go from their old house to their new house. Four hours by ox cart. He said, these days, in a big car, even in a Mercedes, it still takes the same time, four hours. <laughs> because of the traffic. Is that evolution? So anyway, so I always like to question accepting wisdom. Evolution? Have you become a kinder, wiser society? We certainly become a more crowded world. It's amazing we've managed to keep up and still have more resources. If every, that joke I was saying about people going to see these these um, castles in UK. If you actually look at those castles in UK and look at people's houses these days, people's houses in Melbourne are probably far more um, comfortable, elaborate and wealthy than just the, the uh, say, King Henry VIII. We all live in mansions compared to people of old. But, Thank you. have we really sort of uh, developed at all other things? Okay, maybe one last question and then we'll do the meditation. Uh, so I have the question that uh, I have been meditating for many, a few years and it seems up and down all the time. So when I can meditate a lot, then it's a uh, kind of Consciousness and realize it was um, all right, but sometimes when I not meditate, so it's going down, yep. fail, and then make me quite sad. Although I know everything is impermanent, everything is anicca, but still make me feel uh, sad with that. So it's up and down a few times. Yep. So I have decided to. So I have an idea that to be the nun temporarily for three year, three months next yep. year. But unfortunately, I had a young child, mm. so and I have a husband yeah. who not really support. Exactly. 
I was your husband, I would support you if you left a, a young child alone. But I, 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 but I, I was, uh, but I, I, I want to um, continue this journey quickly because I'm afraid all my the master will, who support the female, the nun to do the meditation will, something might happen with them. <laughs> oh, they're going to last a long time. But you're perfectly safe. You don't need to ordain as a nun now. But you can go on retreats, which is great. And just not for too long, because, you know, you've got a duty to your, your child. But anyway, people always want to have, like, even process, even progress in meditation. Meditation doesn't work like that. And there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Every meditation, you may not think it, but every meditation is a good meditation. In fact, you're inclining in that direction. And the key story is the refugee who came to Australia and was a doctor in his old country, but when he came to Australia, those qualifications never sort of uh, weren't recognized. So the only job he could get was on a building site. So he went to the building site on Monday, worked really hard. And at the end of the day, when he came home, how much did you earn? Said his wife, nothing, they never paid me. Didn't get anything out of working hard. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, he also worked really hard. Still got nothing for it, nothing. And on Friday, he went to work, only because his wife told him to go. He didn't really feel like, what's the point of working in Australia to exploit refugees? That's how he thought. But on Friday, he went to work, he didn't work that hard. And the boss gave him a big pay packet. And he went home to his wife and said, I finally understood how things work in Australia. <laughs> From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Fridays. <laughs> and of course, you paid on Friday for all the work you did on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. So when you get a good meditation, that's payment for all the credits you've built up on the times you didn't have a good meditation. So you can't expect every meditation to be payday. It doesn't mean you stop meditation. Little by little you learn, 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 learn and grow. So please look after your kid. It's important. Okay, so now actually we're supposed to be doing some meditation. So my program says